I'll give you a brief intro on from my part. Again, I met Monica. We were kind of reminiscing before we hit live here. We met each other back in 2010 when she first became an agent for my brokerage, LDI. Um, and at that time, she was struggling. And we were, we were remembering that fondly. And uh, it's a lot of fun to kind of reminisce on that. And so, and I, and, and I shared with her how proud I am of her, the progress she's made. She's, she made over in her pocket, in the hip national bank, real net profit, $300,000 last year as an agent. She doesn't own her own brokerage. She's debated on that. We've went back and forth and we've talked about that, but as an agent, she made over $300,000 last year. So, um, and her business continues to thrive even through Corona. There are things going on and we'll probably talk a little bit about that today. But ultimately, um, welcome to the show. Give a little bit of a backstory if you could. Take a minute or two and just give a quick backstory of kind of, you know, how you got here. And then we'll dive into a few questions and we'll see if we can help the audience. Sure. I, uh, I worked in a corporate environment for a number of years. Of course, I've been a jack of all trades. I've done everything from being a welder to restaurant manager and then got into IT and then worked in a uh, EDI department, headed that up for uh, 10 years, I guess. And then my dad suffered a massive stroke and <clears throat> didn't have anybody to take care of him. So I caught myself going back and forth between, uh, you know, the work, the business and trying to carry that with me and take care of my dad at the same time. And it wasn't working out. So I decided to start my own business. So did a little research. What's the, the top growth, you know, industries that I could start a home-based business, take care of dad, that kind of thing. And freight brokerage came up, so here I what am. Year, what That's year was that? What year was that when uh, you first first started? When I very well, I started my business literally uh, July first of 2010 was the official kickoff date. I actually kind of prepped about a year prior to that. Started kind of you know taking some classes, doing some different things in logistics and supply chain and that kind of deal, just because I knew this is what I was going to do. Um, so did the prep work for a year and then 2010 launched with, uh, LDI. Yeah. So the unique, one of the unique things about, about Monica is the fact that in my brokerage, uh, as most of you know, we typically didn't take agents that didn't have an established book of business. Monica knows this too, but apparently she was able to sell her way into that job. She got herself <laughs> in there. Not through yes, me, did. we didn't meet through one of our recruiters or business development people and she got into the business and that's when we met early mm -hmm. on and we started having a dialogue um, and you know, she's really come a long way. But you know, I will tell you this, one of the things that I've noticed about, about Monica that I think most of you can, can either relate with or should take away from this is that she's number one, she's as stubborn as the day is long. So she hates to lose. She's very competitive. She's very stubborn. Ask her husband. Uh, but she's also brilliant in that she is, she learns from mistakes and that's okay. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. She made plenty of mistakes, just like I've made plenty of mistakes, just like you're going to make a ton of mistakes. I promise you that's going to happen. Um, but she persisted over time and her business changed and it was up and it was down and it morphed. Um, but here she is today on the other end of that. And I'm going to let her tell the story a little bit, but here, first question, first question. I, I think this will be helpful for people to give them a sense as to the scale and size of your business, right? Because, you know, when we first started, you know, when you first started, you were happy, like we reminisced of $4,000 in freight in a month was like a, woo, it was like yeah. a big, it was like yeah. a big event. So tell us, a, <laughs> tell us how much, I know you made 300,000 in your pocket as an agent last year, but how much revenue did you do last year? Ballpark. So it was close to four million. We were, so we were four right million. at four million. Mm -hmm. Four million gross. You're an agent, and you're getting uh, you're getting commission on that, right? So you're getting obviously you're commissioned on the margin. Yeah. How many do you have employees? Is it just you? I mean, tell us a little bit about the infrastructure. So I do. Uh, very small. I have two hourly employees. Uh, one that does dispatch, uh, and then one that does administrative stuff for me. She helps me, you know, sort through if carriers haven't turned in paperwork, that kind of thing. She's hourly part time. Um, she was full time before Corona. After Corona, we we decided to do a part time thing, but I didn't let her go. And fortunately, I didn't have to let her go, so we, we managed to work that out. And then I have two sub agents. Um, the sub agents just bring in, you know, I, I help them if, it, you know, they both have full-time jobs. 
So they bring in customers. Um, <clears throat> if something needs to be taken care of during the day, I'll help them out with that. And in exchange, we I take a percentage of their margin. So, they, but I don't. Yeah, they're strictly salary. Oh, they're strictly salary. They're not commissioned. Correct. Well, I, I'm sorry. I meant that the other way around. They're strictly commission, not salary. Yeah. So just so you guys know, because Monica is an agent for a brokerage, she works under an established brokerage who has a license, bond authority, all that. And she works under them. She is a primary agent of that company. She not only has employees that are hourly, but she also has a couple of sub agents and those sub agents work on straight commission. And their primary goal is to generate business, you know, new, new shippers and then move that. And she helps support them and she takes a small piece of their commission for being the, the kind of the mentor or the agent over them, right? So she helps them along the way. And again, it works out really well because she said they both have full-time jobs. And so they don't have time to sp spend as much time on the freight yeah. business. And so, that, you know, that's interesting that you do have a couple of sub agents. I know we talked about that before. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So, so here's a, here's a question for you. And this is something that I think, um, everybody here is probably asking in their head and may even come up as a question later. So let's head it off at the pass. So if you could start all over, right, if you could go back to day one, what do you wish you knew? What, if there was one or two things that you wish you knew about growing a successful freight agency, what would be one or two things you wish you knew in advance that would just have, have really, expedited that process of getting from where you were to struggling to where you are today? I think, I think first and foremost, um, narrowing it down to a niche, um, figuring out which, you know, and, and I thought I had kind of done that, you know, my, my first customer, as you well know, was, was a refrigerated freight. I was moving, um, fresh meat of all things out of a packing plant. Um, so, there was so much involved in that and and i failed miserably um in a lot of places because of because i didn't know about that niche so i think that would be the one thing i would change before i decide on that niche i need to know everything there is about that niche and talk to as many people as i can and get that information up front um moving refrigerated freight includes lumper fees you know because every place cold storage place has these lumpers and you've got you know one place charges you $25 per pallet if you don't have your own pallets and I mean there's all kinds of stuff that that hit me that I just went in the hole on every load I was doing so I think that would be first and foremost you know know your niche pick your niche and then learn your niche before you really dive into it what I love about that is this it's it's a process, right? You need to, yeah. the way I frame it is you need to find the right niche for you, right? Yeah. Refrigerated, there are lots of guys and gals yeah. that do really well in refrigerated. It but it just well. wasn't, mm -hmm. yeah, it just wasn't Monica's gig. But when she, but the problem or the challenge is, is you don't know when you first start, unless you've got a background in this, you may have to go through a couple of iterations of your niche, right? You started in, in refrigerated and now your niche is more flatbed and heavy haul, right? Yes. Right. So but the, but so, the refrigerated freight, I, and I still do some of that, um, but I understand now how to quote it. And that's where, that's what caused the biggest problems is like, I, you know, you look at your, your, your rate, you know, software and you say, okay, well they're paying $2 a mile on this load. So you figure out two dollars a mile, you add in your commission, and boom, you got a rate. That's what I thought. <laughs> but what I didn't know is, hey, before I can quote this customer, I need to tell the customer. I need to know where we're picking up, where we're delivering to, to give you an accurate quote, because I've got to call those places and prep for that and find out what do they charge for accessorials? What are they what are they gonna charge me for that lumper fee? What are they going to do if I miss an appointment, if my truck doesn't get there on time? Because that's happened a bunch of times on those. Any place that's union, um, you know, you, they're, so, they're such sticklers. I have one guy that was, he showed up early for his appointment. Um, the guy told him to go back. You're, you're too early. You're two hours early. you got to come back in two hours. It's your appointment time. So he goes back and he falls asleep in his truck. And two hours and five minutes later, he walks up there and he says, oh, no, you're late for your appointment. We can't take you. You have to reschedule the appointment. It took us two days to get back in there. So now I've got to pay this truck to keep his refrigerator running for two days. You know, there's just all this stuff that comes into play. So 
make sure you understand that you know what you're dealing with and then it's going to make then you then you're able to quote it and I always I always quote you know not too high but higher than what I think I can get it done at just to give me that buffer if I need it yeah and so yeah again understanding your niche and finding the right niche for you is really important so all right thank you for that that's i i totally agree and i think that's where a lot of people mess up early on whoops i fumbled my pen here but i think a lot of people mess up there because they get number one they get fixated on one niche and it and mm -hmm. and, and or they go too wide and they do too many niches right so yeah do some mm -hmm. discovery up front do some research talk to some carriers talk to some shippers talk to some agents talk to some different people and try to put together a real plan a comprehensive plan something that's a you know that educate you what i love about what you said one of the other things is you, you know you called the shipper and you actually before you quoted you called the shipper and you asked what are some of these additional things we might run into costs right and you also probably did the same thing with carriers to understand what their cost was so i mean you did your due diligence right awesome perfect and i can't stress that enough that's really important all right now next all right so here you go this is one i've been I, I'm, I'm curious to ask you and I, I don't even know the answer. I mean, I know some of the things you're really good at, but I'm really curious. What's a unique skill, something unique that you have about you that's helped you to become so successful? What's what's a unique skill that you have? Being Southern. <laughs> Being Southern, okay, expand on that because I think I know where you're going, Be, expand on that. So it's just instinctive and natural for me to, I can carry on a conversation anywhere I go. I mean, I, you know, my kids laugh at me. We, you know, I, we had gone on a trip one time and I got out of the gas station to pump gas in the, in the car and they're all sitting in the vehicle and I start talking to this guy, never met him before in my life. And then the next thing you know, we're laughing and the kids are like, what are we doing? Are we going anywhere right now? You know, and, and, I'm like, they're like, who was that? I get back in the, you know, in the truck to take off, and it's like 30 minutes later, and they're all sweating because it's hot. And I said, they go, who was that guy? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> just being able to talk to anyone and everyone, um, it, that's it's just such a key because you're you. There's no such thing as a cold market. I don't care what anybody says. You 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 can't have a cold market. You have to make that person like the very first second you start engaging with them, um, make them feel like you're their friend and they're, you know, and be genuine. I think that's my thing is just, um, I can genuinely make friends with just about anybody anyway. And, and that helps. And, and you know, you're, you're a hundred percent right. Cause I've seen you in action. I've seen you do it tons and tons of times, you know, in with our, you. In our, yeah. In, I with got everybody. on with LDI and I didn't yep. have any business without that's how you got that that's how you got the agency spot when so many more had been turned away even though you didn't have a real book of business so yeah. so no i i totally agree we touched on that in the front end and you know so one of the things that you guys have to understand is that when you're selling over the phone which is the majority of what you're going to be doing and the majority of what monica does right these days is you have to be able to build rapport quickly and it's hard because they're used to getting tons of cold calls and everybody sounds the same and i've told you this before different is better than better and what i mean by that is you have to take a slightly different approach some people are really witty and funny Monica is one of those people. She's very witty. She's also good at telling stories. If you talk to her long enough, she's going to tell you a story about something that happened in her life. I promise you. I've heard many, many stories. And they're, and they're fascinating because she's had, you know, she relates back stories that are non-related to logistics and, and her even business related to help build rapport with the people she's, you know, that she's just met or the people maybe she's prospecting or whatever the case may be. So those are a couple of tips I definitely want you guys to take away from this because that's really important. And that's that can be learned. Some people are more extroverted. She's definitely an extrovert. I'm definitely an introvert. But I promise you that when I get on the phone or when I'm talking to anybody face to face or on the phone, you know, I, I'm absolutely trying to make sure that I make a good first impression in that first 60 seconds and sometimes wit and humor and telling good stories and having a hook, some sort of a hook. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I mean something that's compelling and interesting that draws them in long enough to invest where you can turn 60 seconds into 
six minutes, right? Because that's really all you're going to get. You're not going to get an hour on a call when you first meet somebody. But if you can get six minutes of quality time with somebody on a phone call when you're prospecting, you touch first base. I mean, you by then you've touched first base and you can't expect a one call close. You have to you have to invest. So I think that's invaluable information. Perfect. All right. So all right, here, here's a good one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, just to add to that, so so people that aren't, you know, as naturally comfortable talking, you know, just perfect strangers, there's one thing that I that I have told my kids, because I've got one child that's, you know, very much introverted and, and, and scared, and the other two are, make me look like Mother Teresa, like they're <laughs> off the chain. Huh? But, but the one that's kind of bashful, that, that's not so sure of himself, I'm, I just said, don't talk about yourself, talk about them, ask them. You know, I mean, the very first thing I'll do is just, oh my goodness, I love, you know, your your hair, your makeup, your your, your truck, your, whatever it is, and like I love your hair, goodness. You know, I, I just can't, I need to figure out your anti-frizz, because I get frizzy, you know, so I need the anti-frizz thing. But just very quickly, don't talk about yourself. Talk about that person you're, you're speaking to. Bring up something that's going to make them, because that instantly makes people feel comfortable. So. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's that's great insight. Ask, you know, people. There's that old saying, right? Um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And if you talk all about you, that's not making them care. Yeah. They don't care about you. They don't care about your background. They don't care about your experience. That will come into play. That will be important. But if you want to get their intention, focus on them. And that's where I've taught and shared gathering some sales intelligence up front and understanding. Perfect example, if you were selling door to door, this is just an easy hypothetical for people to understand, and you pull and you walked up to the driveway and the guy had a Corvette sitting in his driveway and he had a set of golf clubs on the wall. And when you look through the window, he had a, a, a deer head on the, mounted on the wall. Are you going to talk about tennis and a Ford pickup truck and, you know, and being a vegetarian? No. You're going to talk about hunting. You're going to talk about golf. You're going to talk about sports cars. And if you don't, you're missing, you're missing the ball. You're missing the opportunity. And it's harder to do that over the phone. So gathering sales intelligence through sources like their website, uh, through social media like LinkedIn and other sources, just little nuggets of information. And it can't always be about the person, but it can be about the company. So you can talk mm -hmm. intelligently about the company and about their history and about recent press and about recent, you know, about their products and their services and their story of how they originated. Those things are going to go way further to start developing a relationship than talking about you and what's in it for you. Okay. So you got to take the onus off of you. Thank you for injecting and adding that. All right. So here's an interesting one that I thought would be really good for you. And I created these questions just for you, by the way. These are these are one-offs that you know that I haven't. I don't think I've ever asked anybody before. But um, what's one thing that you suck at that people would really be surprised about? <laughs> oh my goodness! By the way, just so you guys know. I did not prepare her for this. She did not no, get these questions in advance. I'm a little nervous about your questions. I have to say, I'm like, you know, I really wish I got the list of questions before we started. <laughs> I wanted to put her on the spot. I wanted to get that real reaction because if, I find that when you give people questions in advance, they prepare answers and they give you, nece not necessarily you, but a lot of people would give the answer that they think you want. I'd rather get the answer that just comes off the top of your tongue. So I'm the most unorganized person you'll ever meet in your life. <laughs> and I have I have no organization skills whatsoever. <laughs> don't let don't let this clean desk back here fool you. I cleaned everything off before I got on here to make it look like I'm organized, but I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's awesome. And so, so the good thing is, is this, if you're sitting here saying to yourself, oh, you know, I don't know if this is right for me. You know, there's a lot of moving parts and multitasking. And I don't know if I'm, you know, I can handle that. The fact is, is that organization is a, an important part of mm -hmm. any business. I don't care what business sure. it is. Sure. And logistics is one of those things where it's, it's a very methodical step-by-step -step process. The cool part about it is that, you know, once you know how to move a flatbed load and you've done let's say 50 or 100 of them, right? You've gotten kind of a little bit of footing underneath that niche. You know, it's very 
wash, rinse, repeat, right? It's very, it's very simple process. And that, that goes for each niche, right? And of course, there's always some nuances, but it's 90% the same, right? There's always some little deltas there. So you can build your processes over time. And those processes are going to keep you in check. They're going to, they're, they're like the checks and balances, yeah. right? And so yeah. it, you know, it's very doable. Don't get overwhelmed with it. It's something you can handle. Trust me, I'm, I'm not very organized. If you saw my office right now, you'd shit because I was liking it. it. I like yeah, it. It's, it's terrible. I have books everywhere. And, uh, it's just, you know, I, I think I was always brought up with the thought process. If you're, if you have a really clean desk, you're not getting anything done. Right. Well, I like that. I heard a little thing not too long ago that said a messy desk is the sign of a genius. So I am like the smartest person you have ever met. Yeah. You're like <laughs> Wiley Coyote, super genius. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome, cool. That's great. All right, so let's um, let's talk about this. Let's let's give a little bit of insight to the audience about maybe uh, a a major challenge that you had um, in in going from where you were back in 2010 to 2020, you know, to where we are today, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Insanely, 10 years later, 2020. So, what's what's one of the biggest challenges you faced in growing your business? Uh. Ooh, um, there's there tons, was, right? I'm sure there's, there's tons. tons. I mean, what, what one really stands so, out as a huge challenge that you think the audience could learn from? I think one of the biggest challenges um, that I've stru struggled with all through, you know, the years, uh, actually up until a conversation you and I had on the inner circle, um, was should I be, should I change over to a brokerage? Um, do, what, do, what's the benefit of me staying an agent? What would be the benefit of me having my own brokerage and then trying to decide which direction to go with that. And, and I think I stumbled a lot because I kept feeling like, well, I really need to now I, I should have graduated into my own brokerage. Um, and it wasn't until you and I had that conversation in inner circle and your advice on that, that, that I, be, that I became much more comfortable exactly where I'm at, knowing that I can I can do this for the next you know 15 20 years if I want to do that do it just like I'm doing it, and I don't necessarily have to change. I can still grow my business as an agent. Um, I don't have because because that was where I was getting hung up. How do I how do I grow the business? I can't manage this all by myself. You know I mean I, what I have on my plate right now. If I didn't have a dispatcher, if I didn't have some sub agents. You know, I wouldn't be able to grow, and um, so I think that was the biggest challenge for me is just trying to decide exactly where I needed to be um, as a business. You know, what type of business? My my business model. Yeah, yeah. So there, just so you guys know, there's different business models, right? In brokerage, the pri the two primary ones. Uh, well, there's three, right? You can you can eat as a freight broker. You can either have an inside call center type business model where you have like a almost like a call center with a bunch of employees. You can do an agent based business model, which is kind of what my company migrated to, where you hire agents and they're all independent contractors. And then the third component is that, as attached to that, is the agents can you know do successful agents do one of two things. They either take that same sort of approach. They either build an inside model with a bunch of employees or they do independent contractors or they pivot into their own brokerage. It would be very easy from a, from a financial perspective for Monica to transition into a brokerage right now. But there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration when you're pivoting from agent to brokerage. The agent job is very small right? It's very isolated and it, and it allows you to provide a very high level of service because it's very small. As a broker, your job gets much wider, right? And, and it's a lot harder to manage and grow a successful brokerage than it is an agency just because there's less, there's more moving parts as a broker. And so, you know, just so you guys know, Monica and I have been friends for 10 years, but I've also consulted and coached and worked with her on the side outside of, you know, outside of just our friendship you know, you guys know I sold LDI four years ago or whatever, but along the way we've worked together and I've helped kind of coach her a little bit. None of what I really did helped significantly. It's all her. 99% of her success is her. But here's the thing. Um, you know, I, I think um, what she was debating on was 
trying to break out and how is she going to, what was going to happen later? And I said, listen, why don't you just build a $10 million agency, make, you know, a half a million dollars a year in your pocket or more, probably more than that, probably six to $800,000 in your pocket and just stick that in hip national bank and not stress about all the receivables and all the paying the carriers and doing all that. I'm telling you, you're based upon your long-term goals. Now, if you would have been 25 and in this position, the advice might have been a little bit different. But you're not 25. You're 40, How do you know that? Right? I you're am 40, too. I'm, right? I'm every bit of 25. I think you're you're only about 40, right? Then some. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so the, the advice would change depending upon where people are in their journey and based on where she was. I think that's the best advice. And she's cashing in and doing extremely well, you know, from a from a business and financial perspective. So I think that was the right right way to go. And I'm and I'm glad that you decided to act on that and and take that roadblock out of your way. Okay, so here's a question that I think everybody in, be interested in. Um, what's the, what's the number one strategy that you use? to get new customers for your business today? Like how do you, how do you generate new business today? I mean, I, other than the sub agents, right? Outside of them, right? How do you personally grow your book today? What would be a strategy you would use? Networking, networking, networking. All, All right, so what do you mean by that? Break that down a little bit. How does that networking work? Well, like give me an example for that. So, no matter, you know, the, the great thing about freight is it's, every business out there everywhere you go there's freight being moved to support that business um you know whether it's providing to that business or or moving around it's it's an opportunity everywhere you go every person you talk to every birthday party you attend every you know family function you attend um one of my the big one of my biggest accounts that I have right now. Um, I gained that business by talking to someone's uncle about where they worked at in the steel company, and then he in turn introduced me to the operations manager, and that opened that door right right up. I mean, it was just that that networking piece. So I'm always thinking about it. No matter what I'm doing, like I said, a children's birthday party. Found out that the, the one of the guys that's the president of one of the, these companies that supplies um, industrial lighting to you know like the city city municipals and municipalities and what have you. They build the big stadium lights and the highway lights and all that stuff at a, at a kid's birthday party talking to him, find out that that got me in that door because he was the president of the company. So, hey, well, what do you do for your freight? Let's talk about it, you know, that kind of thing. So network, network, network. I love that. And so here's the, here's the lesson, guys. You can't expect to grow your business and be the best kept secret. You can't be a, a, a CIA secret agent and at the same time have a successful and thriving business. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. And, you know, Monica, again, she's very good at creating conversations, building rapport, asking people good questions, getting them to open up and have conversations. And then invariably what ends up happening, um, they're going to ask her, so, so what do you do, Monica? And then she says, well, I, I'm in logistics and trucking transportation. And she'll tell a really quick 60 second story of, you know, Hey, I do this for this. And, and at that point people have a, a really strong visual. And the first thing that comes to mind is who do I know? Oh, my uncle Joe works in the steel industry or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever connections, they automatically make that connection. And if you built strong rapport and they like you and they have at least a basic level of trust, you have an opportunity to get introduced, right? So you can do that virtually. You can do that face to face. I've done a lot of that through LinkedIn and through social selling. I'm not a big networking guy. You're getting opposite sides of the spectrum here. You know, uh, you know, Monica is very much, she loves the face to face. You know, she's very, you know, she's very good face to face. She loves being face to face, but she's also done well over the phone. But me, on the other hand, I've never been that networking guy. I've always done it virtually. And so it can be done both ways, right? You have to understand it can definitely be done both ways. And so you, and the other part of it is you always have to have your ear open to what's going on around you. People tell you all the time, well, you know, I, I don't know anybody in, in that's a manufacturer, importer, exporter. You got to think, um, you know, kind of the whole K 
Kevin Bacon, you know, phenomena, right? The six degrees of separation. Everybody knows somebody who works mm-hmm. in manufacturing, import, export, has some sort of a product that they either buy or sell. Bottom line, it's all around us, everything. Those books, that crazy dinosaur skull, my desk, the computer, the webcam, you know, Monica's chair, it all went on a truck. And so if you tell me I don't know where leads are, I don't have opportunities, look around. You got to pay attention and you got to, and, and networking is, is a great way to do that. And obviously we already talked about some of Monica's strengths, which is the fact that she's Southern, very Southern, and she can make great conversations and that builds rapport very quickly. So you wanted to add well, something? Yeah, just, just another, I have customers I've never even seen in person, you know, that, that evolved because you ask the question. Um, one of one of the companies that I signed on early early on was a cold storage facility that was scheduled we were scheduling appointments for hey who else do you have coming in here I mean I may you know have some more so if I do I have to do anything different well we've got this one company that comes out of um, someplace in Missouri and their their trucks their guys suck we we just hate their drivers well do you guys do you route those yourself you know so we start talking so no but let me give you the number of the guy that does so when i call the guy that he gave me the number to the first thing i do is say hey joe from kokomo over here gave me your number so instantaneously he knows it's not a cold call somebody gave him the number so he's interested he's going to listen to what i have to say and just from that we got that account moving cheese you know out of missouri yeah. So. It's it's funny how if you just ask simple questions, you keep your ear open, you know, and listening and ask good questions, how great things can happen. So that's awesome. Yeah. Just just to let everybody know, um, you know, for those of you that are curious, if you're on here and you're considering becoming an agent or you're considering becoming a broker, right? You've already seen how profitable being an agent can be and how I highly recommend if you don't have a ton of experience starting as an agent. But if you want to start as a broker or an agent, you know, most of you already know that I have freightbrokerbootcamp.com, which is the most comprehensive and cost-effective online freight broker training program. Trained over 7,000 brokers and agents. Been business for over a decade. You can check that out at freightbrokerbootcamp.com. Again, 60-day, 100% money-back guarantee. You know, if if you're not happy, no questions asked. We'll give your money back. We have a you know like a 97% customer satisfaction rate. So I'm really not worried about it. So check that out if you guys are curious. So I want you guys to get after it, get busy, start moving the needle towards your goals. Uh, Monica did, and it's made all the difference. So I want to thank her for being here. You guys have an awesome day and we'll be back next Monday at noon, like every Monday. So make sure you're here. Have an awesome week and we'll talk soon. Dennis, you're my hero. Thank you. Thanks for having me.